the Nintendo Wii shattered records and expectations of what a video game console can do and who it was intended for. With a whopping 101 million units sold, the Wii appealed to people of all ages and demographics, thanks to its simple and easy to understand motion controls. However, there was a downside. Thanks to the heavy install base and the ease of development compared to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, the Wii became the go-to console to make utter shit games for. Developers released horrible, god-awful games at an alarming rate, turning the Wii's game library into a cesspool. So today, we'll be looking at 15 hilariously awful Wii games. Now just to be clear, there are hundreds and hundreds of really generic, really bad, simple games on the Wii. And doing an actual top list like this would be way too long and way too big. So we'll be focusing on games that were especially bad. So with that being said, let's begin. Smurf's Dance Party Ubisoft is well known for rehashing the same game year after year, as evident with their Assassin's Creed and Just Dance series. But this? Smurf This is a rehash in the worst way ever. Smurf's Dance Party is exactly what it sounds like. Like Just Dance, you hold the Wii Remote and then dance to songs while the characters on screen show you the moves. Except these characters are Smurfs. Smurfs that stare blankly at the player while they go through the motions of dancing. Most of the songs present in this game are either covers of popular songs like Just The Way You Are by Bruno Mars, or awful original songs about the Smurfs themselves. The only songs that were allowed to have the original versions were Who Let the Dogs Out, Walk This Way, and Walking on Sunshine, which aren't exactly strangers to shitty kids media. The whole game is just uncomfortable to look at, unless you're just into Papa Smurf gyrating in front of you while looking stoned out of his mind. The game was nowhere near as successful as its Smurfless cousins in the Just Dance series, and went on to receive scores like a whopping 3 out of 10. I suppose when your main selling song has a repeated line like, Smurf your whole day long, you're kind of asking for it. M&M's Kart Racing There is nothing worse than a food brand that sells you an advert in the form of a game. Very rarely is the product not complete and utter shit. From Burger King's Sneak King When hunger strikes, it's up to you to strike back. To Cold Stone Creamies Scoop it up. Good job. Thank you. It always comes across like cheap afterthought to try and appeal to as many demographics as possible. And sometimes they end up on the list of worst games of all time. Enter M&M's Kart Racing. Nothing to do with the rapper, but the brand that makes sweets. Like most racing games, you pick your character and your cart and jump into a variety of race courses. Only this time you get to race as M&Ms. Woohoo! But you can choose whatever one you want. Like the red one, the orange one, the green one, the blue one. And I am honestly past the point of giving a fuck. Anyways, while driving around in all these famous M&M locations, such as the house and mountains, you'll come across nuts scattered around the road, a bit like the coins in Mario Kart. Unlike coins though, these nuts do absolutely nothing. Yeah, the nuts are used in the arcade mode in order to access the next track. But it looks like the developers forgot to take them out of every other mode. So they're just there. The game is so horrendously slow and unfair to play. It was even featured in the Guinness 2011 World Records Gamers Edition as the lowest ranked kart racer ever. You know what? It's a good thing that M&Ms are fucking delicious because this is a fucking disgrace this is why brand mascot games are always a bad idea always no exceptions major miners majestic march 
you would assume that a game created by the creator and designer of Parappa the Rapper and Masaya Masuda would be a slam dunk. Unfortunately, Major Miner's Majestic March is anything but. The game is built on a rather interesting idea, which is using the Rewa Remote as a mace, a form of baton used exclusively for drum majors, in order to lead a parade. The game looked quite promising at first, being created by a notable figure in the rhythm game world, as well as being a unique idea in a world full of shovelware. The outcome was pretty awful though. The game's art style on the Wii looks incredibly ugly despite the system being more powerful than the PS1, where Parappa the Rapper looked great. It's short, repetitive, and grating with how long the unskippable cutscenes can be. But the biggest and most important nail in the coffin is, of course, the motion controls. It's always the motion controls. Despite being a relatively simple concept of just moving the Wii remote up and down, the controls are very inconsistent, which are coupled with frustrating tempo drops and gestures that are just not recognized by the game. Upon its initial release in Japan, the game only sold 600 copies in its first two days. Reviews ranged from 3 out of 10 to a harsh zero. Game Informer said in their review, if I'm going to spend a long period of time with my hand wrap around an oblong object moving it rapidly up and down, it sure won't be with this game. Calvin Tucker's Redneck Jamboree This one just hurts to look at. Feast your eyes upon Calvin Tucker's Redneck Jamboree, the first game for rednecks, possibly by rednecks. Developed by Humigade, Redneck Jamboree features 12 exciting mini-games based on some of the most popular backwoods activities, including shooting shit in your backyard, fishing with dynamite, racing with lawnmowers, opening bottles with your disgusting cavity-ridden teeth, betting on where your cow will take a shit, and many more. Good old-fashioned American fun. Each of these games have been done a million times before and a million times better. However, we'll give some credit each of the games are pretty varied, they didn't just repeat the same one over and over again. They did half-ass everything else though. The game might get a few laughs out of your friends because it is pretty shitty, but it won't last long. It's funny in the same way that Larry the Cable Guy is funny. It's not. Oh yeah, and Calvin Tucker, the guy in the title of the game, doesn't exist. You might think that that was a real person or something, but no, he was completely made up for this game. Check and shoot. What happens when you take an early Flash game from 2000 and port it to the Wii, but at the same time, upping the price significantly? Well, you get check and shoot. Originally developed by Toon Tracks, the game was later ported to various other consoles and handhelds, like the DS, Game Boy Advance, mobile phones, and of course, the Wii. The game itself is exceedingly simple. All you do is shoot fucking chickens. That's it. That's the whole game. You point at the chicken and press B to shoot. Nothing else. One excerpt describes the plot of the game as this tiresome bunch of feathered troublemakers is not given any peace. Stop this hostile destruction from these rampaging roosters. But when you actually play the game, You'll find yourself shooting chickens that are minding their own business. Who is the true villain here, huh? Clearly it isn't the chickens. Say what you want about the Angry Bird ports for the Wii, but at least some effort was put into them. This on the other hand is just awful, plain and simple. Jenga World Tour Imagine for a moment that you've been given a choice between two different ways to spend your afternoon. Your first choice is a game of Jenga. This stressful yet rewarding game that can provide a good hour of entertainment between you and a friend. The second choice is Jenga World Tour for the Wii. This stressful, unrewarding game that will provide absolutely no hours of entertainment and by the end of it you'll likely lose a friend trying to play this. Now, the entire concept of Jenga is to carefully remove blocks and not cause the entire stack to fall over. It's a game of careful and precise movement based on real-world physics, something that can't be completely recreated in a video game, or at least not in a shitty Wii game. 
When converting these skillful moves to the Wii, they just don't work. You're using motion controllers with a remote controller to emulate what your bare hands can do. And guess what? It, it just sucks. The game at least attempts to make Jenga a bit more interesting by adding different types of blocks, power-ups, etc. But the damage has already been done the second you inserted the game disc. It's a Jenga game on the Wii! The game was universally panned for its poor physics system and expensive price, even leading it to get a honorable mention in GameSpot's flat out worst game of 2007 reward. On the bright side, at least you don't have to clean up the pile of blocks when you're finished. By the time you're done playing this game, you won't have a friend to help you clean up. London Taxi Rush Hour While the Wii was the best-selling games console of the 7th generation, it still couldn't topple godlike sales of the PS2, the best-selling video game console of all time. Much like the Wii, the PS2 had a lot of shitty shovelware games in its library. Although not as many, quite a few of these games overlapped as well. Receiving a version on both the Wii and PS2, one of these games is London Taxi Rush Hour. This budget title, developed by Data Design Interactive, and Metro 3D. Yeah, that's right. These two developers behind this shit show was released on PS2, Windows, and Wii. Despite being the same game, the PS2 version received generally unfavorable reviews, while the Wii version received overwhelming dislikes on Metacritic. So, what happened here? How did this shitty ass game somehow get even shittier? Let's have a look. So it turns out that London Taxi Rush Hour is a carbon copy of the classic arcade title Crazy Taxi, just minus all the good bits. The controls are loose and janky, there's hardly any speed and there's no chaos. The graphics are unsurprisingly shit as well. It's clear that the shading and lighting was never considered here, as driving under shadows has absolutely no effect on your car. The one thing that makes the Wii version shittier is, wait for it, motion controls. You gotta hold the Wii remote sideways and tilt it like a stupid jackass trying to figure out how this game got the Nintendo seal approval. Given how unprecise these motion controls are, it's nearly impossible to drive precisely how and where you want to go. Mario Kart Wii, this is most definitely not. Action Girls Racing Here's a fun fact. Adding a Z to the end of the word where an S should go does not make your game cool. Apparently our friends at Data Design Interactive didn't get the memo and decided to make Action Girls Racing. Much like London Taxi, this game was released on the PS2 in 2005, with the Wii port coming out in 2007. It's clear that this game was a shallow attempt to appeal to girl gamers through tired and awful tropes by slapping hearts and flowers on everything and utilizing girl power in a patronizing way. The back of the box literally says, the only racing game designed by girls for girls. And to be fair, the entire staff was made up of women. Except for Paul Weir, the audio producer. So I guess that statement is mostly correct. Since motion controls worked out so well for London Taxi Rush Hour, it only made sense to actively make them worse. And every time you bump into something, you come to a screeching halt and have to start back up again. Every. Single. Fucking. Time. Obviously, this game was ripped apart by critics. IGN gave it a 0.8 out of 10, making it the lowest scoring game from Data Design Interactive. It also became the second lowest scoring PS2 game of all time on GameFAQs, as well as the ninth lowest Wii game. iCarly Of course there was an iCarly game for the Wii. I mean, where else would it go? The Wii was tailor-made for it. The game was developed by Blitz Games. You know, with a Z, because it has to be radical, of course. It's essentially a mini-game compilation that basically has nothing to do with the show itself. The premise of the game is that Neville has taken down iCarly, so they have to play mini-games to get it back. 
Yeah, that, that's the plot, but if the developers didn't care, then why should we? The mini games include swatting hungry hands away from a pie, chopping meat in half, and breaking out some sick dance moves. The game was critically panned, with one reviewer even stating that a toddler could play the game with absolutely no issue whatsoever. The iCarly video game franchise didn't really get good until the sequel, iCarly 2, I Joined the Click. Hey dude! What's up? You dropped your backpack. Unlike the first game, this is an adventure game where you play as a Mary Sue new kid who is immediately accepted into the iCarly friend group, leading you to become the savior of the web series. Your player is also apparently the Flash, given how insanely fast you run. Also, it looks like everyone in this universe speaks Simlish. <laughs> The game presents itself as a single-player adventure game, but it's really just using that as a front to hide its uh, shitty mini-game compilation roots. Aside from that, there's a home decorating system, like the Animal Crossing series, since apparently this 14-year-old owns an entire apartment by themselves. Overall, the iCarly games are exactly what you expect them to be. Painfully boring. Alvin and the Chipmunks. If you think the worst thing to happen to the Alvin and the Chipmunks franchise is the 2007 live action reboot, then you're sadly mistaken. The game was developed by Sensory Sweep Entertainment and follows the Chipmunks as they play across various venues. The gameplay borrows from the most popular rhythm franchises of all time. Guitar Hero and Rock Band having the player press buttons along with music in order to win. But unlike those games though, it's virtually impossible to fail a song. If you manage to miss a few notes, nothing changes, you can't lose. The song doesn't mess up, the chipmunks don't screw up on stage, and the game carries on as if you're playing the show of the century. Somehow, the game was able to secure over 40 songs from actual bands and artists like Blink-182, Run DMC and Elvis Presley. To very little surprise, the Wii version is the worst reviewed of the bunch. And why is that? Two words, motion controls. Shaking the Wii remote does not automatically mean fun, nor does it need to be present in every single Wii game. Sadly, developers didn't realize this until long after the Wii was laid to rest. Pets. All of them. Given that this is Ubisoft, they didn't waste any time releasing a shitload of Pets games on the Wii and DS. This was definitely a case of quantity over quality, as most of these games just sucked for anyone who was over the age of 5. Now, granted, that is the target demographic for these games, and they really were not intended to be looked at through the eyes of an adult gamer. but. This is the internet, and we're gonna complain about it anyways. During the Wii's lifespan, we were treated to a total of seven Pets games. And while the DS got a whooping 29, holy shit, how deep does this Pets franchise go? The games is your basic pet simulation game, why is there 29 of them? No, I'm not, e I'm not even recording, like, what the fuck? <laughs> shit. The game series is just your basic pet simulation game. You adopt an animal, you feed them, you care for them, and make sure they don't drop dead. The original games in the series were received pretty well, while the Wii and DS games were seen as mostly mediocre to uh, negative. There are games that are far worse than the pet series, so why is it on here, you may ask? It's because between the Wii and DS, the library is simply littered with them with almost no differences between any of the games. Sure, there are different breeds and types of animals and a few different objectives, but they're all relatively the same damn game. 
They're not god-awful, and they're relatively harmless, but they're always picking up dust at every GameStop and Walmart bargain bin. Chances are your Walmart is still selling a Wii Pets game at around $40 because they just can't get rid of them. Game Party. What can you really expect from a video game titled Game Party? It's truly the most basic title imaginable, possibly in all of fucking video game history. One of the most common examples of shovelware on the Wii are the mini game collections. They're relatively easy to develop and give off the illusion of variety and loads of content. Game Party is known as the king of mini game collection shovelware on the Wii. It's been held as one of the worst games of all time, with many review sites giving the game too many 1 out of 10s to count. Now you might be asking yourself, what kind of shitty motion controlled games can we play that nobody asked for? Well, you get to choose between seven mini games, air hockey, hoop shoot, darts, ski ball, beer pong, shuffleboard, and trivia. The game sold over three million units. This led to Game Party 2 and 3 being released on the Wii and the franchise continuing on the Kinect and the Wii U. Unsurprisingly, they were all received terribly and thanks to barely anyone buying the Wii U, even less people bought Game Party on it, leading to the series ending hopefully forever. Kids Sports, all of them. Data Design Interactive is seriously determined to set the record for the most shitty Wii games under their belt. This is already their third time on this list. The Kids Sports series was developed by Data Design between 2004 and 2008, starting their shitty Z naming scheme a year before Action Girls Racing, starting out on the PS2 and later ported to the Wii. The series includes five games, Kids Sports Basketball, Ice Hockey, International Soccer, and the Wii exclusives Kids Sports Mini Golf 1 and 2. As is tradition, they are all complete shit. Each game has received a 1 out of 10, thanks to their ugly graphics, awful motion controls, and incredibly stupid AI. Each game also has their own set of quirks, such as jumping and holding the basketball with no penalty, shots in hockey not working 50% of the time, and tackling in soccer requiring you to shove the Wii Remote and Nunchuck inwards towards your chest. These games are just nothing but a plague on the Wii's library. They hurt to watch. Balls of Fury 2007 was a year chock full of mediocre comedy films. This was the year we got movies like I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, haha, <laughs> gay, funny, Norbit, and Epic Movie. But one painfully mediocre film that stood out from the crowd, all thanks to the Wii, mind you, was that film Balls of Fury. You know, you know the one. The film where Christopher Walken plays a Chinese ping pong player? It boggles the mind why this of all films would receive a video game tie-in, given that live action films, especially comedies, rarely ever get the video game treatment after the Super Nintendo era. The game was developed by Black Lantern Studios, known for their work on Iron Chef Wii and Bubble Guppies for the DS. You may swing your remote, but it only really matters if you move the remote left to right, and that's it. That's a strategy. Your character will paddle the ball back no matter what. You can quite literally, with no exaggeration, throw the rear remote across the room and it still registers you rallying the ball back. Aside from the piss poor tennis, the rest of the game isn't pleasant either. If you commit the unforgivable sin of picking story mode, you have the events of the film explained to you through an agonizing amount of text overlaid on stills of the film. Instead of cramming a few cutscenes from the film like so many other movie tie-in games do, they went the cheapest and laziest route imaginable. It would have been better if they not included a story at all. There's no reason for this game to exist. Who was it made for? Certainly not kids, given the film it's based on. Certainly not fans of the film because, I mean, let's face it here, I'm the only one. And certainly not for people who don't want their eyes to bleed, given that they were subjected to a horribly textured model of Christopher Walken that looks like the you're not perfect guy from Courage the Cowardly Dog. 
Target Terror. How could a game made by Konami make it onto this list? Well, not by modern Konami, that's a whole other can of worms. We're talking about 2008 Konami, back when they were still making games like Castlevania and Silent Hill. The game in question, Target Terror, was actually initially developed by Raw Thrills in 2004, and was only ported to the Wii by Konami. Raw Thrills was known for their work on arcade games, such as Guitar Hero Arcade, the Big Buck Hunter series, and the Fast and Furious racing games. Target Terror was initially released in arcades in 2004, and made little to no impact. Barely anybody was talking about this game, so it's surprising that such a huge company like Konami would even bother porting it to the Wii. But they did, and oh boy did it get people's attention. The game is about shooting terrorists, who are attacking various places in the United States. Players must shoot terrorists in a laughably bad looking shooting gallery, with all the terrorists being portrayed by real people, poorly digitized into the game. Furthermore, these terrorists are complete morons, rolling out right into the open and hesitating to shoot at you. The visuals were so bad, IGN went on to award it with the worst visuals on the Wii Award in 2009. The final level takes the player to a hijacked plane that's planning a suicide attack on the White House. After defeating the terrorists, the president applauds the player, saying, quote, It's because of heroes like yourself that this country is a safe place for democracy and the American way of life. Unquote. Then you get a screen that says, To be continued. Yeah, a sequel was in development, but was quickly cancelled after its announcement. Raw Thrills is still alive and well, currently working on a Halo arcade game set to be released this year. So who knows, maybe a sequel is possible. We all know that modern Konami is all about making bad decisions. Ninja Breadman, Myth Makers, Trixie and Toyland, Anubis 2, and Rock and Roll Adventures. You may be wondering, why is this entry made up of four different games? Well, despite its clever camouflage, all four of these games are in fact, the same exact game. Leave it to our friends over at Data Design Interactive to sell the same shitty game four different times. Our story begins not on the Wii, but on the PS2. A 3D platformer titled Ninja Breadman was released, and quickly became known as one of the worst games of all time. However, the title originally began as a reimagining of the Commodore Amiga classic, Zool Ninja of the Nth Dimension. Zoo Digital Publishing commissioned Data Design to do the reboot, but after seeing that the prototype was hot ass, they cut ties and took Zool with them. Data Design didn't want their code to go to waste, so they continued working on it, eventually leading it to become Ninja Breadman. Data Design seems to love making their bad games worse, so they shoehorn motion controls into the Wii version. In order for Ninja Breadman to jump, you have to shake the nunchuck upwards, and if you want him to double jump, you have to flick it again. Why they thought this would be a good idea for a 3D platformer, where jumping is like 75% of it, is beyond us. It's a shame really, because the pun title of Ninja Breadman is actually kind of clever. If only it was used for an actual good game, but nope. Given that this game was so good, they decided to release it again under the name Anubis 2. And no, this is not a sequel, there is no Anubis 1. It's supposed to be pronounced as Anubis the Second. The gameplay is identical to Ninja Breadman, right down to the shitty motion controls. You can actually see that the floating platforms in this game are just retextured from Ninja Breadman. The company released 30 games in 2007 alone, thanks to their reuse of code, assets, and music, which led to the exact same glitches and bugs being present in all their games as well. Good going, guys. After Anubis 2, we got Trixie and Toyland in 2008. This time, they reused everything, including the soundtrack from Ninja Breadman. There's really barely anything to say here that we haven't said before, it's just literally the same game. The final one is Rock and Roll Adventures. Like the previous three games, Rock and Roll has three levels, a tutorial, motion controls, shitty music, shitty gameplay, and shitty everything. Except this time, you play as a tiny Elvis. All four of these games were so universally panned, and sold horribly, rightfully so. They're so unbelievably lazy, not to mention shady as fuck with their high price tags upon release. I mean, it's entirely possible that these games were just to scam people. In August 2012, Data Design Interactive went out of business, liberating the world from their attempts at game development forever. It's a shame though, because they were developing Ninja Breadman 2, Blades of Fury, right before they went bankrupt. But it's okay, you can play any four of these games and get the same experience. There's really a 0% chance that Ninja Breadman 2 would have been any different.